Next we have uh, Jerry Grigar, who's going to talk about what is your residue worth and the Lucas model for soil organic matter. Good afternoon. I used to be known as a hole man in another life. About 20 years ago, I was a very agronomist uh, in this area, stumped no-till. And it's kind of interesting to come back now 20 years later, and here's a lot of the same things I was talking about 20 years ago. Earthworms, improved infiltration, and the benefits of organic matter, and reduced erosion, all the good things that the no-till system does for you. But today I'm going to talk a little bit about stuff we've already heard today, but I'm going to talk about how much is your residue worth. Uh, we saw some pretty big figures that Paul Gross put up there. Or one percent organic matter worth of stuff. What was it, six hundred and sixty dollars or something like that an acre? Well, I'm going to talk about what's your residue worth because there are people in this world that are talking about biofuels, bioenergy, and there's even a group in Michigan State that's getting ready to build biofuel. Uh, elevators where you can bail up your residue and take it down there just like you do grain or, or uh, wheat or oats and sell it to the elevator for, for making biofuel. It's actually an initiative at Michigan State, a group that's about three years out from uh, putting together their first bioenergy plant made from corn stover and other uh, materials like that. So what's your residue worth? We know it's good for erosion. Control, it's road prediction, and if you're expecting a big PowerPoint presentation, this is it, me. I'm going to be your PowerPoint presentation. And your handout, okay? Your handout is something you want to kind of keep long because we're going to go through it together, all right? I get tired of PowerPoint, I don't know about you, but I get a little sick of them, so I decided to go back to the old paper way. So, organic matter is uh, what's your residue worth? Well, organic matter is the nation's most precious resource. This was written by Daniel Albright, 1938, in a book called Soils and Man. And we heard a lot about the benefits of soil organic matter. And we know that soil organic matter comes from the recycling of residue and roots and uh, other organic substances like manure and cover crops into the soil by soil biota. We heard a lot about that this morning. But what if the man comes to town with a $20 bill? And he says, Joe, hand out your hand, Joe. You're Dan, but you're going to be Joe today. You going to take this $20 bill for a ton of your residue? I want to buy it for buying fuel. And no! What's wrong with my 20? It's got Jackson on it. He's about four, he about four or five. I, don't think, I think it's got the line in it. I don't think it's counterfeit. Yeah, the line in there. Why won't you take 20 bucks for it? How much I got to give you? He wants four of my weed. He wants four of my weed, suckers. Well, the guy bought up a four beer. <laughs> so, all right. So, what is your residue really worth? Have you ever thought about it? Because you know that that day is fast approaching, where there are going to be these cellulosic ethanol plants, and there's going to be people knocking on your door, like like the old wild salesman, want to buy your residue. So, you as a farmer need to make some informed decisions. How much are you going to be willing to sell it for? What's it going to cost for you to haul it? What's it going to cost for you to bail it up? Get, how far are you going to have to go with it? So let's look at it just from a nutrient standpoint. Let's, let's take a look at what crop residue would be. It's just from the from N, P, and K, the big three nutrients that we all purchase to grow corn on our farm. Or soybeans or wheat or alfalfa. If we look here at this table one, nutrient removal by several crops. This came right out of a bulletin from Michigan State University. Some of you may recognize it. If you ever looked up their fertilizer recommendations, this came out of the old E550. E550 was the field crop nutrient recommendation bulletin from MSU. It was for years. Then we got somebody new in there and they changed the number on us old guys and I never can remember the new one, but I do remember old E550. I think the new one's 2634. I don't know why they got to do that. Paul just leaves things alone. 
always going to make us think hard. But barley straw a ton, according to this nutrient removal chart, takes out about 13 pounds of and 3 pounds of phosphorus and 52 pounds of K2O. And down at the bottom, I called the elevator and I said, what's the price of phosphate today? And the potash at 28%. And they gave me those prices, $640 a ton for MAP, $570 a ton for potash, $385 a ton for 28%. So then I figured out, well, what's the cost per pound of the actual nutrient to, to replace it? And it works out that phosphate is about 62 cents a pound, potash is 55 cents a pound at this price, so 28% is about 69 cents a pound. Now that you know what the price per pound is of each of these nutrients, you can multiply it by the amount removed and get an estimate of what's it going to cost to replace that residue just from N, P, and K only, not the transportation and the bailing and the hauling and all the other things it's going to have to win with. Just what's it going to cost you to replace the nutrients when you sell that ton of residue to Dan, because he's going to be the residue sales from your buyer in another life. <laughs> what is it? What's it going to cost? So flip over in the back side. I did the math with a cell spreadsheet. I wanted to know myself. Would you believe that a ton of barley straw, just for the N, P, and K, is worth $38 a ton? The old straw is worth $41 a ton. The wheat straw is worth $22, and the corn stover is worth $36. And brothers, that don't include bailing the stuff up, putting it on the truck, and hauling it to town. That's just the new so, we'll see if Dan's any smart. Dan, now that you know what you know, you gonna give me a ton of residue for 20 bucks, that barley straw? He said no. His mama didn't raise no fool. <laughs> didn't raise no fool. He's not gonna sell for that. He wants two, two or three of these. Now, what'd you say, five? You gotta have five. <laughs> so don't be no fool. When a man comes from town to buy your residue for bioenergy, don't give it away. Realize what it's worth. It's just like any crop. Do a crop nutrient budget with your extension folks. Find out what it's going to cost you to harvest it up, bale it, stack it, store it. All, all the town before you give it away. Don't give it away too cheap. That being said, I heard Mark say something this morning, I'm going to go contrary to what Mark said. He said, we can't sell this residue for bioenergy. We need it to protect the soil and do all this stuff. Stand up here, Dan, would you? I want to show Mark something. Okay? Now, if you were looking at Dan, turn around so you can face them and see what you look like. It's good looking guy. Now, what's the difference here between him and me? Which one's tall? You guys can all see this, right? Which one's Tom? <laughs> Dan, right? All right, thanks, Dan. I needed that. That's good. Which so where would I help I go with this? I was younger and better looking, too. Well, where I'm going with this is residue. Do you ever corn for silage? Something? What's that silage corn like? <coughs> Not all corn plants are equal, right? There's like Dan, you look at Dan, you tell Dan he's taller, stronger, younger, better looking than me. Okay? You want to do some much luck with And uh, corn plants the same way. Corn can be bred to be taller. It can be bred to put out some bigger stalks. It can be, I never saw it so vividly as when I had to grow, got some decab from my, one of my friends and compared it next to my Pioneer last year. And the cap is twice as tall as the cap, twice as big around. And the ears are up ahead. So there's differences between hybrids. And what we're going to have to do, we can, we can have a win-win situation here. But we're going to have to be smart about it. We're going to have to breed hybrids that are tall if we're going to sell them for biofuel. We're going to have a look. Yeah. 
Um, if you're breeding them for height, won't that increase the biomass and increase the amount of nutrients that they use from your land? So well, these are all things we need to find out, isn't it? We know it's going to uh, remove so much per ton. I don't think it's going to matter whether, you know, it's still going to be per ton. Whether it's producing 5 ton or 15 ton of biomass, it's still going to be the same per ton. And once you find that out, if it's, then you can put a price on it. That's my point. You can do a price like I did here. Then if you want to remove a ton of residue, and then you can say, okay, I'll, I'm willing to sell this much for residue for bioenergy, <clears throat> but I'm still putting enough residue back to maintain the organic matter in my soil or increase the soil health. What a nice win-win situation. Do okay? you think that's doable? I think it is. I think we can breed plants that are tall. I think we can We've already done it with silage corn. We can breed plants that yield well. We can plant plants a little bit thicker than we've been planting them and still maintain organic matter and still some residue, still some residue for biofuel use. But then the question, we know all these benefits of organic matter. And so corn growers have always said, oh, we know that our organic matter comes from the residue, it increases our water holding capacity in the soil. We know it increases our cation exchange capacity. We know the residue helps reduce erosion and improve water quality. Residue helps build organic matter to improve infiltration and reduce runoff. Organic matter helps reduce soil compaction, air pollution, reduce the amount of fertilizer that we need out there. Organic matter is a storehouse for nutrients. We increase the soil's buffer capacity. We increase biological activity like Mark was showing this morning. We get more of the cedamites, and bacteria, and fungi. We increase nutrient cycling and storage, and on and on it goes. So why would we want to get rid of our residue? Well, the, the question comes, can we have this win-win situation? Can we quantify soil organic matter in a man with a model of some kind that will help you as a farmer plan your residue and your management of, of residue on your farm in such a way that you maintain productivity yet sell it for bioenergy. Well we know from some of the work that Dr. Lucas who worked on soil organic matter uh, cycling and carbon cycling at Michigan State for a lot of years. He was a premier professor in this area. And through his work, he found it requires four to 6,000 pounds of crop residue just to maintain the soil organic matter. In other words, if you want to maintain your current soil organic matter level, you've got to return between four and 6,000 pounds of crop residue to maintain the organic matter where it is right now. This depends on the soil, the climate, and the tillage. And there are three types of organic matter pools. When you first put organic matter into the soil, it goes into the active pool. It's active because this is where a lot of biological activity occurs to bust down that organic residue and, and put it back into the system as nutrients and carbon and carbon dioxide. And then there's a certain amount that goes in the active pool. Then after that, as residue is broken down into very small pieces, then some of it goes into what they call the slow pool. And the slow eventually breaks down the long carbon chains and the harder to decompose, and they're protected by soil aggregates and stuff, and they eventually get into what we call the stable pool. The stable pool of organic matter is the very dead stuff. It's the stuff that's in the coffin, okay? You hear the coffin, it's very dead. And that's the stuff we measure. It's the stuff we measure and we call soil organic matter. The very dead stuff. We don't measure the active and the, and the slow released organic matter. So the challenge becomes when you're modeling soil organic matter to, to predict what the trend is going to be, whether it's going to be up whether it's going to be down, depending on the cropping system, the tillage, the uh, yield levels you get, the temperature and the moisture in the soil, the aeration of the soil. It becomes quite a challenge to put 
hard numbers on this science because there are so many variables. So I had the opportunity to work with a fellow named uh, Dr. Dr. Lucas and Dr. Jenkinson, and they came up with a model. And the model I call the Lucas model. And the challenge is too to calibrate such models is to find some long-term studies where they've monitored <coughs> soil carbon or organic matter changes in the soil for years and years and years. We don't have that many locations in the United States to do that. And one of what we do have is the borough plots, and they're located in Urbana, Champaign, Illinois. And this graph here, borough plots, shows the decline in organic matter over time from under continuous core, more plowing. And these are on the prairie soils that started out at 4% organic matter. And in 40 years, they had lost a fourth of their organic matter, almost 33, down to 3%. And it, they kind of leveled off after that, between 40 and 60 years in the plots. And they've stayed there, even with increased yields and hybrid corn, they really haven't been able to increase the soil organic matter back up to um, 4%. Same way on the chart below, this was a study that Dr. Lucas did. He started out with a soil that had 2% uh, soil organic matter, it was Matia Lomi sand, quite, quite, quite aerated, so the residue seed tends to decompose quite rapidly. And if you remove two, four, and 6,000 pounds of residue, off the site in a 40 year period, it would drop below one and a half, almost down to 1.5% organic matter from two. So you can see changes in organic matter are very slow. They're not like really rapid. It's, it's a long term thing. It doesn't happen just overnight. It takes time to build organic matter, it takes time to change it. There's some other charts like that in there that on the next page where we looked at. If we could increase the yield 1, 2, and 3%, what would happen to the organic matter? And if you look at the 3% yield increase, that's the last chart. And we, uh, we take off 2,000 pounds of residue every year, but we increase the yield by 3%. How can you do that on a dry soil? What practice could you use to increase the yield from 85 pounds, 85 bushels of the acre? up to say 180. Here Everybody's buying them now. You bought one last week, right? An irrigation system, right? Irrigation is how you can increase the yield over time. So by increasing the yield, using irrigation, using modern management techniques, you could take off 2,000 pounds of residue and as long as that yield was increasing, over 40 years time you would still increase the soil organic matter. That's what basically what this chart is telling, okay? And I developed that with something I call the Lucas model. And on the back page is the Lucas model. It's, it's the first spreadsheet I put together based on Bob Lucas's model. And he worked with, with this fellow named David Jenkinson from England, Rothenstead, England, that looked at continuous wheat in the 100 year system. In our climate, that's how they came up with the, it takes Four to 6,000 pounds of residue. Between the two of them, and what they saw in organic matter <coughs> modeling, they found it takes four to 6,000 pounds of residue to maintain the soil's organic matter at right where it is. So I call these guys the founding fathers, Dr. Lucas and Dr. Jenkinson. And based on Lucas's model that he came up with with Jenkinson, I put together an Excel spreadsheet that would be as farmer friendly. And this Excel spreadsheet, if you know what your starting soil organic matter is, you can put in the starting organic matter, you can put in your corn yield, and it will predict what your organic matter is going to be down the road for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. So how could that be useful to you? Well, working with Ohio State, I took the model as far as I could, they came up with a more useful model, a 
more farmer friendly model through a grant given to them by the Michigan Corn Growers that will answer these questions. Number one, what if I sell my residue? What's going to happen to my organic matter? If I know what it is currently. Can I change my tillage and compare no-till to conventional till? What will that mean to my organic matter? Can I add manure to replace the organic matter that I've lost from the sale of residue? How much residue can I afford to sell? Can I change my rotation? So I run two years of corn, maybe, and one year of soybean, and still maintain the organic matter. How useful would a model like that be to you as farmers to help me answer this question, do I want to sell my residue for bioenergy? Would that be useful if you had such a prediction tool? Corn growers thought so. They thought it was so useful that they put up $30,000 to develop a I call the Soil Organic Matter Calculator, and it's based on this Lucas model I've been talking about. So the question might come in your mind, can you build organic matter with no-till over time? Well, I just, I've been a no-tiller for 30 years. So I said, I want to take a look at what had happened to my organic matter in that 30-year period. Here is a chart from my farm, uh, Mark Hill Oak, this graph right here. And in 1981, it tested 3.6%, so organic matter on this scale. Today, it tests 4.2. It hasn't been tilled in 30 years. On the next page, there's another, uh, I've Mark Hill Oak in here twice, I don't know why. <laughs> First, I looked at this. On the second, on the next page of the Metamora sandy loam, that's a, a little lighter soil. The soil organic matter from 1981 has gone up from 3.9 to 2012 to 5.3. You say, how could that do that? What's the difference between the two fields of both the same soil for the idea? How could one accumulate more organic matter than the other over time? Crop rotation, man, you're smart. Give that man a hand. But it's a crop rotation. What crop in your rotation will increase the organic matter probably the most? Probably the best soil build of the rest if you're bearing it. Help, help them. Your grass head. That's the best soil organic matter builder you've got on the farm. Okay? And this field has seven years of hay in it compared to the other one. And that's how much difference there was uh, in organic matter building over time. So alfalfa is your, is your friend when you're trying to build organic matter. Now, look at the last graph there. That's been known to 25 years. It's a cape actually. And it's dropped from 4.4 to 3.7. I've had to actually had a loss in organic matter, yet I've been no telling all the time. Why do you suppose I had a loss? What caused that? I have the Earthworms? What's happening for you? Trying to call you all. I'm certainly ash green farmer. Small farmer bureaucrat just farms for the moment. No. No. But no till for 25 years, just like the other people. Look at the initial organic matter, what was it? Very high, 4.4. The higher the organic matter you start out with, the more residue it takes to maintain the status quo. You've got to put more residue back to maintain 4.4% residue. So obviously, in that 25 year time period, I wasn't putting enough residue back from corn and soybean and wheat rotation, or soybeans than corn and wheat. Soybeans have less residue than 6,000 pounds per acre. So I wasn't putting enough back to maintain the soil organic matter. So that's why this field has a deficit, because it started out high. It's a lot easier to build the organic matter up if you depleted the soil down here to 1%. It's a lot quicker, easier to build it back up to 2-3%. 
than it is to take a field that's already 4% and try to build it higher. It's, it's much more difficult because it takes a lot more residue to get up to that next level. Okay? So that's why you need a tool because every field's history is different depending on when it was cleared, how it was, I say, used or not used by the previous farmers, and how much erosion has occurred. Okay. So you need to know where you're at with your soil organic matter level before you start selling your residue off the farm. So you know, so you can plan for the future to build what you need to do to build your organic matter and increase soil productivity, increase soil health, and increase profits down the road. The amount of available water that you get from the increased organic matter is, is tremendous. And I've seen it. I've lived through the drought of 88, and I've lived through the drought of 92, and the drought of God knows we had no droughts in Grash County. But I'm one of the few no tellers that have been in a long, long time in the county. And when you can walk across the road with the guy that farms 9,000 acres, on July 1st this year, his corn looked like pineapple. You thought he was growing pineapple, not corn. But I'm a long-term no-till where I had lots of available water due to the high levels of organic matter I built up over time in the soil accumulated. My corn never stressed. It's sitting there like a hula girl. <laughs> the leaves are out like this. Say, hey man, let the sun shine. We like this stuff. Yeah. You see these things if you live long enough. You're lucky enough. Watch what's going on around here. Okay. Alright, let's see what the bottle does. Let's see if I can. Anytime you go to show something, it usually blows up. So we'll see if we get lucky. So, what is the range of soil or percentage? What's the range of per soil organic matter? Well, it depends on the drainage <laughs> and the soil type. But generally, most Michigan soils are range if they're not much, between 1 and 5%. 1 to 5%. Typical soil organic. Most soils in Michigan will usually fall between two and three. And the lighter soils will be down probably less than two. It's hard to maintain organic matter much above two percent in very sandy soils because they're well aerated and they decompose a lot quicker than a soil that's not as well aerated and damper and has more clay. But the cooler, the damper the soil the more organic matter will accumulate. And you, all you gotta do is look at muck. Muck is a fine example of that. How did that soil form? Under water, in wetness. The residue de didn't decompose rapidly, so over time it accumulated, okay? That's how you got muck. It wasn't until man came along with big shovels and put dredges in. Lon Helpman back then he used to drain wetlands in another one. <laughs> Remember that Lon? Straight my class, class one, class two, so you can drain them. <laughs> <laughs> then class three, when the ducks flew out, they're supposed to leave below. <laughs> we used to have a simple classification. Remember that one, two, three. Yeah. Once you drain the ducks, then the farm people can farm them. Tell them they can do well. But then once you drain them, the problem you have is maintaining the home. Because in the aeration it tends to oxidize the soil and turn the microbes loose and they start decomposing because they have food, they have a carbon source. And so they went crazy when you stir them up, you stir the fire and you till them and, and they decompose them, they subside. That's why a lot of monks are gone today because they didn't do a good job of draining the water management. Lots of monk farmers will raise their water fields in the fall to keep that decomposition from occurring because it stays wet and cold. Alright, so let's see the focus model. I got a little sidetracked. Right.
this is a, a Lucas model that has a guide. It's going to be available by link on, on the Michigan Corn Growers site probably within a couple of weeks. Ohio State's working with them to establish this link. They're going to maintain ownership of the model. I don't know if they're going to sell it for like 10 bucks a copy or what, but they're talking about that. But you're going to get to see an advanced version of what's going to be available to the public, to farmers or to people like Dan or, or to uh, Bruce over there that want to work on uh, managing soil organic matter through the different uh, management systems. So you have a data entry form, and you press that data entry form button, and I don't like it because I haven't enabled the macro. So let's see, I got to options, I got to enable the macro. So you say enable it. You'll get that on your startup of any time you use this model for the first time. It's run by a series of macro commands. So you got to enable macros. So you have to have a newer version of Excel, something newer than 2007, I think it is, or more. And it, it tells that in the help screen. So data entry form is the first button we're going to put in here. And it wants to know, would you like to clear the input from the previous run? It's a smart computer, so you have to answer some questions and say yes. And up comes this data entry form. Now this is where you as the farmer, in order for somebody to work with you on a field-by-field -field basis, you have to have some basic information. You have to know your recent soil organic matter from the soil test. You have to know something about the cropping system and the yields of each crop that you're going to grow out there. And it helps to know whether you're going to no-till or conventional till or molar plow or mulch till. And you also need to know something about manure management if you're applying manure and if you're going to use cover crops. Because the more of this information you can provide the planner, the better job you can do of predicting what's going to happen to your soil or changes over time. So let's, the first thing it's going to ask you what the start year is. Well, that can be any, any year. That can be from records 10 years ago. That can be now. The important thing is, is you need the information from the past 10 years to be a bit more accurate. But if you don't have it, it's okay. You can use the current year. So let's use the current year, 2013. And let's say we well, are a young farmer like Dan, so you're going to be around another 40 years. By then I'll probably be in the ground, but Dan will still be here. So 2053, he wants to see what's going to happen to his organic matter. So it's going to do a simulation now for 41 years. So you save the years. <coughs> And then now it wants to know something damn about your cropping rotation. So since corn's seven dollars, Dan says I'm gonna grow corn until the moon goes goes away. So he's gonna grow corn forever. So he's a continuous corn. And what kind of yield are you gonna get out there, Dan? Grow continuous corn on your farm. It's 120 good. <coughs> Dan's optimistic. He's, he says final. Climate warming is going to help him. It's going to rain a lot. So he's going to get 150. And the hybrids are going to get better, right? What kind of tillage are you going to do? Don't know? Or do you want to pick one? You're going to do rotational tillage, mulch tillage, no till, conventional till. What do you want to do? I can't know until you have your plow now. I might ask you. <laughs> Conventional television. They're plowing. How deep do you plow? Shallow or deep? Six inches? Alright, that's easy. We're going to use the same tillage type without the rotation. You're not putting any manure on. We're going to do a simple, just straight corn analysis here, okay? And then at this point, you save and go to the next crop and you enter done, and then that allows you to go to the organic matter baseline. So let's say Dan's been pounding the hell out of the soil so we don't have much organic matter. He's got 1.5% out there. According to his current 
soil test. And your sampling depth has been 0 to 6 inches, is what you've been sampling for soil samples. And now it's going to ask you, what's your soil organic matter decay rate? When's the last time you looked that number up, Dan? <laughs> Don't roll your eyes at me. But <laughs> ever see that little question mark? That's the help button. Everybody needs one of them now and then. So, in this case, what kind of soil you got on your farm? Loamy sand, sandy loam, what do you got? Clay loam, clay, what do you got? You got a clay loam, so use the drop down, loam, clay loam. And we're going to tell it less than 8 inches deep because you don't want to burn all that fuel. So, it's recommended after you do that that you use a decay rate of 2.5%. And you notice a little chart down there? Use the following guidelines for decay rate. And that's for us dumb farmers like me. If you don't know what decay rate you should use, you can go to this chart and pick it. Okay? So we're going to put in 2.5%. So, okay, we don't like it until I shut up. So back here now, we're going to have the 2.5 because we looked it up and it says that's what we should use. Okay? And now you're done with that. And at this point, you had all that information at your fingertips and was able to put this information in the computer. You're ready to project what your organic matter is going to be in 2053. Any guess? What do you think it's going to be? Is it going to be better than 1.5 or worse? Dan says if he keeps plowing and beating the ground, it's going to be worse. Anybody want to take another view? It's going to be better or worse? Does anybody think it's going to be better? Continuous corn. Yeah. You think it's going to be better? Mm -hmm. Well, look at it. This is, this, is, this is no gray area. It's either black or white. Is it going to be better or <laughs> It's going to be better, right? He says it's better. You say it's worse. Well, which one gets the 20 bucks? We'll find out in a second. <laughs> and once it's a smart computer, so it says, you won't be able to change this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Don't you get it? So it's doing math. The macros are working. I was just more entertaining than powerful. <laughs> Alright. So now, it said, Dan, your success. This form will close after you click it, okay? Okay. And now you get a little report. See this tab down here that says report? You see where my cursor is at the bottom? It says report. You click on the report. And there's your projected organic man use, he gets the 20 bucks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and what it's saying is, if you could grow continuous corn and average 150 bushel, and if your soil was at 1.5% organic matter when you started this down this journey 40 years ago, and then when you get to be my age, this stuff will be about 2.12% organic. Now, how cool is that for a planet? Huh? So he's going to be, if they're going to feed the world, that's going to be below the national average on yield there. Well, you can always, there's tools in here to allow you to project the yield increase. Okay. I just haven't shown it to you. I'm trying to keep it simple right now. <laughs> can you bear with me? We're going to take it a step at a time. Residue on the corn? That's leaving all the residue and putting it all back. <coughs> you notice off to the side here, remember I talked about those pools in your handout? The active pool, the old pool. What the model is doing is partitioning a certain amount of, this is the total amount of residue produced from one year of corn crop, about 11,000 pounds. 7,000 of it's going, or about 66%, is going into the active pool after that first year. And then 8% is going into the old pool. So addition, every year, another 8% of this is going in to build the old pool, and that's what increases your organic matter over time. Notice what happens when you get out here. At 40 years, the band's tired and wants to sell this farm to somebody else to put up to this stuff. You notice it isn't changing much. And the reason for that is at 40 years, you're at steady state. The amount of gains that you're getting from the organic matter and putting in the old pool is equaling the losses from decomposition. 
So that's not, that's why you're not increasing soil organic matter. Dr. Lucas talks about this in research report 358. He says the steady state usually will occur somewhere out there 40 to 60 years after you start increasing the organic matter content in the soil. It takes about that long before gains start to equal losses. Okay, how much more do you want to see? My right around the start. Now, what would that have done on a year like this? where you haven't got as much organic matter due to the health. Okay. It would, well, remember, this is doing averages. So okay. in a year that you don't produce as much residue, obviously, it's not going to put as much back in the pool. But then there's the year you're going to get 200 bushel of corn. And so over time, that evens up. You see what I'm saying? Okay. I'm interested in what the rotation does, the crop rotation. You want to try a crop rotation? Let's go for it. Let's see what happens. I'll see if I can make it work. Oh, hit the wrong button. Sorry, it's probably going to close. Oh, yeah. oh I gotta go back to the calculator. You guys should have sold me that. Dummy. Yeah, go back to the data entry form. Would you like to say the clear the input? Yeah, we're going to clear it. Okay, let's go to 2013, go out to 2053, and we're going to save the years. So we're going to do 41 years simulation. There's some skip and some other buttons that I must profess I haven't mastered yet, but you can use the inputs from the previous run and click the check the uh, skip button. So, what rotation server would you like to make me to model for you today? Please. You want to go continuous beans for 41 years? No. Get lots of nematodes and all that stuff? Can I say rotation of fish for 40 beans? Okay. I just pick it up. Or beans. Alright. <laughs> corn. And what kind of yield do you want to get out of your corn, sir? Uh, Same yield. You, know, you want to use 120? Yeah, 150. Okay. Uh, 50. Yeah, 150. Oh, he, he yeah. wants to, like Dan, he wants to recruit. Yeah. Well, I was just trying to keep all the. Uh, How about 1500? That work. You <laughs> <laughs> make too much fun. All right, 150 bush. And what kind of tillage serve do you want to use? Same, same, same. Do you want to use conventional? Do you want to use conventional? Do you want to use conventional? Right. And you want to keep it six inches deep? Okay. Okay, so if you want to save this, now if you want to put it in another crop, you've got to click save and go over the next crop. Okay. <laughs> Let's ask you, okay, what's the next crop going to be? Soybeans. Soybeans. How many yields, sir, do you want to use? 50. Yeah. I thought I would have had the contest when I reminded you what. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sensitive. Yeah, I think it wasn't you. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. What's the telling? The same conventional, conventional yeah, tillage. Well, it'll be a ground meter. Okay, it's going to be a ground meter. So same, we'll go to the next crop. Not the only two crops you want to grow this, this time. Just two. Just two this time. Yeah. So we're done. You always got, remember, you always got to press the done button or it won't, it's a dumb computer. It won't know what to do. And what organic matter do you want to start with? You want to use Dan's 1.5? Just like before? Just like before. Okay. And you want to sample six inches deep? Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to use the clay loam soil again. So same you want to soil. Same soil. So we'll use the 2.5 because we already looked it up, right? Yep. And so we're done. Okay. And at this point, again, we're ready to calculate. So you hit the calculate button. And they always ask you this question. And you say, yeah, I'm a, I don't care. Run. <laughs> it takes a little while. I don't want to cough in the high five and be able to do this. Okay, let's check out the report. Well, according to this report, in 40 years, you're still for a 
soil is more organic matter. Notice it's not as much, it's not as fast because soybeans is a crop. If you look at it here, it doesn't produce as much resin. Not nearly as much. What if you have all the things the same you put a cover crop in? We can do that. Is that the next thing you want to do? I would love to see the difference between everything being the same. You want to keep and everything the same and now you want to add a cover crop? Yep. At least after bees. Let's see if we can do that. Because we've been talking about cover crops. Oh, dear, see if you can know how to do this. Clear. We'll just put everything in. Help me remember what I'm supposed to put in there. Okay. 2013, 2053. Same years. I guess I probably could have used the inputs from previous run here, but I want blowouts. So let's just do it this way. 150, right?
notice with the, the globe wrap off the side of kind of says the same thing as the report. It's a little easier to see in the report. Notice just by simply adding the rye cover crop in there every year and using the same corn soybean rotation. You were able to build slow organic matter over time up to the, from 1.5 to 2 percent in that that, How did that compare to the other one? How did that compare to the other two? Uh, the other, the, the corn and soybean was lower, remember? Okay. And the continuous corn was about the same. Seems but better. the reason the continuous corn was the same because it produces more residue in those soybean years where you would have soybeans now. You got more residue going back into the soil so it builds organic Now, would you build organic faster if you no till compared to. Okay, now he wants to no till. He's <laughs> really modern on the guys. He wants to mark his plows. It's getting tired. There's nothing harder than plowing. If you've never plowed, then you don't know that until you've done it. Then go back to no till. No till looks like heaven. Okay. So now we're going to keep everything else the same. Now let's see if we can do that without blowing it up. And let's no till. Yeah, we're going to clear it because I don't trust the same thing yet. It don't take that long to put it. 2013, 2015, save the years. Crop, instead of corn, and it's going to be the world champion in Allegan County, so it's going to grow harder than Richie Wood. And these tire bounces are going to go up there. We're going to use the same tillage for everything. So save it. I'm just going to go corn or soybeans. Here, soybeans. And I'm put in 50 bushel. And yeah, I'm probably going to get 65 now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, more moisture. Save and go to the next crop. So we're done. We change the tillage. Slow organic matter was 1.5. And our BK rate. Horses, so a little bit higher. It's about 2.27, so it's slightly higher than the low pill. What is the big factor then with the burn rate or whatever you had on carbon and the depth of tillage? What's the big the factor? Carbon loss or the tillage? Yeah, the depth or the depth and the tillage. Anytime you aerate the soil. You break up those, Mark was talking about it this morning, those associations that occur with fungi that build the, the soil structure and the soil and help aggregate the soil. And those aggregates are to help protect that active carbon that's in the soil. The glomerulum and the excretes from the worms, you know how the worms are kind of sticky? Yeah. That helps hold soil particles together. And the minute you do a lot of tillage, that fires up the microbes because they get oxygen. They gotta have oxygen and carbon. 
and once you get oxygen and carbon, they bust down the soil aggregates and they release the carbon as carbon dioxide, just because they're eating. Just like when I breathe, we release carbon dioxide. Well, they're eating, they release the carbon dioxide, and there goes your carbon. And that's why your soil organic matter decomposes more rapidly than the timber, because you generate the soil and you can explode the bacteria the population that busts down the fungi. The bacteria eat the fungi. So that, that's what happens. So vertical tillage where you're only working an inch and a half or two inches deep, is that harming that as much? No. No, because it's pretty much leaving all those associations intact, mm -hmm. except that little zone that you're working there where you can plant the seed. So yeah, it's, um, I've been a zone tiller for, I started up with the Rawson system back in the 80s when we were still using John Gibbs pop holders on this for his cultures before he started making his own. I had, in 1985, I had a Ross and Zone Tiller made out of John Deere pop holders. It was around three inches wide, three colders, you know. And my soil organic matter, you can see it there in the, in the handout here. This is actually off my farm. I didn't talk about it yet. But you see field one there, eight one. When I started farming in 81, when my dad died, I took a soil sample. The soil organic matter was 3.6 in that field there on the park alone, H1. But this year, the soil organic matter now is 4.2, and that's after 25 years of soil tillage. A few years in the beginning where I was transitioning, still was to tillage. Dad first died, so it didn't start. Really, no telling until '85 on this field or so. Same way with the next field down in Metamore. That's gone from 3.9 to 5.33. That's been known until about 25 years as well. But that's the one that had the alfalfa in the crop rotation, seven years of alfalfa. So it increased the demand a bunch more. The next field down, that didn't increase. Remember, I said I had one field. Field three there that went down, and it's because it started out at 4.4 in the beginning. So it wasn't putting enough residue back in those 25 years to maintain it at 4.4 percent. The next field down came back. That increased from 3.3 to 4.46. So from almost all the fields there, except the real sandy loam fields, which again have more rapid decomposition higher decomposition rate of the loams, I've been able to increase the soil organic matter over time with no tillers. Yeah, no tillers are friend. Is the K pack the heaviest soil you have? What's that? Is the K pack the heaviest soil you have there? Oh no, the one away by far is the heavy. The one away right there, that's a clay okay. loam. That's a one five uh, seat. Poorly graded clay loam. It's uh, heavier than the Park Hill. That would be very similar. Yeah, it's heavier than Park Hill. That would be very similar to uh, Blom, Blom, you guys have around here. Yeah. We have a lot of key. Or more than we have on more than we do in Nestor, I guess. What's on the side? Nestor or Or Blom. 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 Yeah. I know I work with James now. The biggest thing about a row of side hills is the bulk density is gone up on them and you want to get your yield on because you're not getting the yield there like you are in the plant. Part of the reason is because of the road. Part of the reason is because of the loss of solar organic matter. So I remember the story of Canadian told me they did a study in Canada on this and they said the Canadians wanted to see what would happen if they took a plastic of straw deep in that hillside. Quite heavily, you know, 20, 30 ton, and worked it out and uh, compared yields to that where they did it. He said, Jerry, he said, I can set my kitchen window, look out the window, and he said, I can see that spot for the next 12 years. How much better the crop was doing when we had plastered that side of the window. So if you got a road of side of this, you got a road, it's a good way to deal Just to put it in there and we'll work it in and then start a hotel room. Just so you can bring it back. All right. That's all about lies. Let's take a really quick break. <laughs> Just a few minutes. And then uh, we start our day.
discussion on corn residue and anything else that you haven't had answered for the day. Bring that up.